In this podcast, I'll be talking to Rob, who's an awesome dad, doing awesome work to support other dads. Hi there, my name's James, and thank you so much for checking out my podcast, Dad Mind Matters, helping men to safely navigate family life without losing their minds. In this podcast, I'm lucky enough to be talking to single father coach Rob on, amongst other things, how to create healthy boundaries. My name is Rob Rohde, and I am a single father coach, and I have created a coaching program called the Single Father Mastery Program. And that program is designed specifically to help single dads um, create healthy boundaries and establish um, safe home environment and create really solid life-changing relationships with their kids. And then I'm also the host of the Business of Being Dad podcast. And that is a podcast that is releases daily episodes. And the topics there are kind of similar, but it's more for all fathers and the The main topics are leadership, legacy, and fatherhood. Okay. So that's, I mean, that's what I do. And I guess who I am is a father, first and foremost. Yeah. I guess it all starts there for me. So. What was the, what what made you want to start the podcast? Yeah. So I was in a position where, like so many of us in this space, where we had a career that we were kind of kind of in the middle of going through and things were going well for a while, a career that had nothing to do with this. You know, my career was in healthcare and I've worked at pediatric hospitals for the last 25 years. And I was just kind of trudging through, through that and was, I apologize by all accounts. I was doing really well in that. I had some great opportunities. I got to work on on the flight program. And then I advanced into leadership and management. And, you know, in a way I really liked that job, but some things in my life just kind of, kind of hit me hard. And I had some circumstances really that kind of led me to kind of re-examine what I wanted out of my life. And so basically what happened was about six years ago, um, at that point, my the girl's mom and I were divorced, and we were kind of co-parenting, and we had split time with our daughters. Uh, we have five daughters, by the way, and so that's amazing. Wow. But that yeah. is amazing. So we were kind of going through that process, and things were again still decent for a while, for a long while, until we reached a point where. Um, I was actually on a a guy's trip, just hanging out with some of my really good friends for a weekend getaway. And I received a phone call. And in that phone call, I was told that there were some concerns of abuse that was going on with my daughters. And that phone call led us down this kind of series of events that just totally changed our life. And I guess to kind of cut to the chase, it kind of climaxed about a year later after that point in time when um, my girl's mom took her life. And I'm so, so sorry. That's so, yeah, I mean, words don't really work in these sorts of situations. Um, I'm just really sorry. Yeah, for it, That's horrendous. it was. Yeah, thank you for that. And you know, it was difficult, obviously, that's kind of the understatement of the year, but um, it was incredibly difficult for my daughters, and it was very difficult for me as well, but it also kind of led me down this path of really examining my life, um, not just from a logistical standpoint, you know, now I had my kids 100% of the time as opposed to split custody, and, you know, there was that side of it, but there was also the side of am I doing what I really want to do right now? And it kind of seems crazy to say on on the surface because, you know, I worked in healthcare. I was taking care of sick patients. I was doing something that by all accounts is extremely valuable and noble, but I didn't feel that sense of kind of fulfillment from that anymore. I didn't have that sense of purpose from it anymore. Um, And so Having, we were kind of going through life and really going through the recovery 
process. There were also court cases involved in a variety of other things that really just kind of kept the stress piling on for a period of time. Um, and it reached this climax about two years following the girl's mom's death when I just decided I needed to do something different. And I am very fortunate that I was in a position to do this, but I um, took a little bit of time off or actually kind of a long chunk of time off. And I just re-examined my life. But I also used that time to, for the girls and I to kind of get away and try to, to heal because yeah. we were in this survival mode. And even though we were, you know, going to counseling and, you know, doing all the things and that we were, you know, that everybody says you do in those situations. And I was, we had a solid community and I was leaning on that community and we had great people in our life we hadn't really paused to be able to allow for some of that deep work to take place internally. And yeah. also I think that I needed for me personally, I needed to know that my kids were in a little bit of a safer place before I could even look at myself. I just didn't have the capability of looking deeply into myself at that point or prior to that. But on one of our trips that we took during that time, I kind of just made a decision. I decided, you know what? These, these things that happened to us, as awful as they were, there's an opportunity here to, to use this for something good. You know, there's an opportunity, pardon the, the cliche, but to allow maybe my mess or my family's mess to transition into or transform into my mission and my right. mission of what it's I It's a very to brave do. way of looking at it. I mean, I admire you for doing that because I, I can't, I can't possibly imagine the depths you've been through or your, your family been through. So to have the strength of character to, for that to be, want to be the outcome. I, I hope you've given yourself some credit for that. Um, you know, I'm not super big on giving myself credit for things, but uh, <laughs> well, your dad, you. that, that's standard. Um, well, you as a complete that, stranger though. who's heard your story for the first time, I, I, I admire you for that. Because that's something that I don't know if I'd be able to recover from something like that. And I'm sure people listening to the podcast um, would, 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 you know, would I don't know, would be uplifted, if that's the right word, by... Because you're right, things happen to us in life which are horrendous. And, and if you have the strength to be able to try and, I don't know, use it for some sort of benefit, then that's amazing, I think. Um, well, I, I appreciate your words. And I appreciate you saying that. And, you know, I don't want to oversimplify this and I definitely don't want to take away from the impact of suicide or the impact of, of any sort of loss or trauma that takes place. And so I'm not saying that in any way. I'm saying that in spite of all of that, as we are continuing to go through all of that, I am making the intentional choice to try to, to do something positive with that. I'm not in any way saying it didn't impact us or it didn't, or it's not still impacting us today because it absolutely is. Um, but I've tried to make a point on my, my podcast in particular, but in general to be as transparent and open as, as possible. And I feel that there's, there's value in that for my listeners, but there's also value in that for myself. You know, I feel like yeah. as I'm, yeah, as I'm speaking and as I talk through this, I'm spending as much time working on myself internally and talking to myself as I am talking to anybody else. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, I started, um, I've struggled with my mental health for years. Um, I, I, I did a, a course with, um, our medical and national health service in 2010 and I got told I had OCD which actually made a lot of sense and explained a lot um, but I've battled with depression for years and I found actually the creative outlet of having a podcast um, it's just a much it's, it's a way of channeling that anxiety or when I have intrusive thoughts if I it they always say you know if you've got a problem one way of dealing with it is get a bigger problem and I found that by talking to other people if I feel that that what I'm doing, it, it, yeah, it helps me as much as it helps, hopefully, someone listening. Um, definitely. I think that's something, telling your story, 
um, a helps you because it kind of it's it's a cathartic process. Um, when I I used to have a job where I worked on um, uh, basically managing lifeguard services um, in Brighton where we live, um, and after oh, oh, very sadly we had to deal with incidents of drownings and. The first thing we did after an incident is you have what's got a hot debrief, which is basically because obviously it happens in the middle of a ship. You need to check that everyone involved is actually in an, in an OK position to to continue work. Um, and actually, really, what everyone does, everyone involved tells their story. And it's kind of a way of, I think, just dealing with it, t- telling your story, hearing other people's perceptions, putting a few bits together. But actually, it's ultimately kind of car- talking yourself down. So I think, yeah, I, I imagine that your podcast is reaching lots of people. And I imagine probably in a ways that you don't realise because people aren't very good at actually responding and saying, and uh, that would be something that I think we, we could do more. And I try and do it when I, if I see someone doing something on social media that I think takes courage, I, I try and tell them because you don't know how much a comment a kind comment from a complete stranger, so therefore no one with an agenda means and can might really be the you know thing that pushes someone on. Um, so yeah, I might. Yeah, it sounds like you're doing great work. Thank you, I appreciate it, and you as well. And that is one of the reasons that I have been intrigued by you for a bit now is that <laughs> your willingness and your honesty, your willingness to be vulnerable, and your honesty around your personal struggles, and I think that. You know, in society today, it is still true that it is not necessarily viewed in a macho kind of masculine way to to express yourself yeah. and and to to express your feelings in generally in general, but in particular, your struggles and the deeply personal ones. And so, I, I admire you for doing that as well. And thank you from my from my standpoint this is how I, this is how I view it. I mean, my, my kind of shtick or my, my, the philosophy behind what I do is this, is that we all need to take ownership of our life. And then when we take ownership of our life, we have the ability to really kind of make an impact and create a legacy that we desire. But for a period of time, I really kind of got stuck in that ownership side of things, and I didn't balance the humility piece of it. And okay. so that's a piece of what I've kind of talked about over the last couple of weeks on my podcast is that, you know, I think I I firmly believe that we all have the ability to become the, the man that we want to be, the father we want to be, and create the legacy that we desire. We all do. I 100% believe that. But as we're going through that process, part of, part of taking ownership requires us to look inward and say, you know what, there are some things that have happened in my life. There are some things that have happened in my past that have deeply hurt me or that have de- deeply hurt those that I care about. And some of those things happened to us that we really had no control over. Yeah. Some of those things we might might be based on decisions we've made, but either way, it is impossible to reach that level of impact and leave that legacy that we desire if we don't look inward and start taking care of ourselves a little bit better and work through that. Yeah, I agree. And I don't think it's very good. We are as, as men or as dads, I think quite often you put, you're busy rushing around checking everyone else is okay. And the idea of, I sometimes feel guilty if I'm not doing something. I sometimes just can't sit down and have a beer and watch some rugby. I feel like I should be out. I don't know tidying up the garden or doing something and actually you're absolutely right it's like you need i'm no use to anyone if i'm if i'm burnt out and stressed there's there's no it's not it's a weird thing i think it probably is a parent actually to feel like you should be putting yourself first at any time um but yeah it's really important because also what you're showing your children i think you need you're, you're trying to show them actually you need to look after yourself you know you need for me to be the best version and, and help you um because life's going to throw stuff at you constantly there's constant curveballs and i think if you're not getting enough sleep well you're not looking after yourself or you're not look as you said looking inward and prepared to do the work then you're going to struggle and i think those 
it's those those cracks will appear, which is why people had have, have nervous breakdowns in their forties and fifties, because they've never done the work, you know, from being, I don't know, bullied as a child or some sort of I don't know. And it's it's, it's not when it comes out, it not sorry, it's not if it comes out, it's when it comes out, basically. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I agree a hundred percent. And I I think that the key is for us to 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 put it out there and to start talking about it a little bit more and and make it something that is um a little bit more accepted you know when we have this forum and we have this space and what i mean by that is to the conversation is to be having these conversations and to be to kind of fight against that stigma and fight against those stereotypes and so that is a piece of what you know, what I hope to do, but that's just a part of it. I mean, on a deeper level, I really want <clears throat> to, I apologize. No problem. It's fine, man. I apologize, man. I am fighting off a cold, but oh, I really no, wanted sorry. to be here with you. So <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, but I, I think that as we fight through some of that, that stigma, we have the opportunity to, to kind of show not just the current generation of fathers, but the future generation of fathers, some yeah. of those younger fathers that, it's okay to do this. And in, in truth, it's not just okay. It is pretty much the, the highest level of courage that we can, we can show is by, by being willing to do this and being willing to be vulnerable. Well, uh, yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. And I think actually it's sometimes if you feel like, you know, people are scared to tell their story and to be vocal and to, because it makes you vulnerable. And I sometimes found, okay, if I change the narrative, I, I, it's not. I'm not doing this for myself. I'm doing this because my my kids need me to do this. They need. I, we've got to start blazing a trail so that when my two sons are my age, if they're having a an, a mental health issue, it's you know we've done more of the work. We have blazed the trail more than. I mean, my dad's generation. You didn't show your feelings. You know, you didn't show your feelings, and you you either had probably fairly unhealthy coping strategies, um, drugs or alcohol or whatever. Or you blew, or you know, you know, or, or you kind of like, you know, you just exploded when you were 40, 40 if you had a nervous breakdown and you were never the same again. And actually, I don't think that's, that's not, that's not clever. That's not, you know, if you think about, well, if I want myself to be functioning, a functioning adult in my 70s or 80s, there's going to be times when, I, you know, there's going to be fault lines in my 50s, 40s and 50s that I need to deal with. I need to actually go, okay. This is a bit of a moment. I need to do some work, work out one thing like this before I don't ignore it. <laughs> don't don't bury it. That's the worst thing you can do. Yeah, definitely. And you know, I think in, in terms of your comment about our our kids kind of kind of watching us and kind of seeing this and working with them on that, I think the society that we're in today, this this era that we're in with all of the technology, how quickly everything um, how quickly kids are able to find information, social media, streaming of shows, all of that. There is this very short attention span that they have. And so I feel that sometimes we try to sit down and have these really deep, meaningful conversations with our kids that it's just going to, they're not going to absorb it. No. You know, if we do it in shorter bite size pieces, maybe we can get that point across, but really they're watching what we do. And our best way to, yeah. to have a conversation with them is through the nonverbal ways in which we model the behaviors that we want to see in our kids. We model the willingness to deal with our own issues. We model self-care, things along those lines. I think that has a much greater impact, and it's extremely important, especially today. Yeah, I agree. I think if, if, if your children see you as a as a, as a a happy, successful, grateful human being and, and and someone who takes exercise and someone who doesn't, you know, overindulge in, in whatever, they're going to think, well, you're right. They're going to pick up and think, well, that kind of works. That kind of, that seems all right. That's quite, you know, his life's good. Certainly when he maybe compares to other men or other fathers of his friends, you know, um, it, it is it is important to set the standards. Um, and I, I couldn't agree with you more about the attention span. I think it's, I think things like the social social media has just killed anyone's ability to concentrate. But when the what's weird is I find that podcasts, which potentially, you know, can be ten minutes to an hour and ten minutes, people will listen to that because I think I think 
people, I think there's a whole generation of people who are very, very lonely. Either even if you're, you know, in, in, in living in a house with your family and there's four or five people in that house, people can still feel very lonely because we are a lot of what we do is online. We don't have that same face to face. But I think in the same way that say listening to a radio, listening to a podcast, certainly someone who whose voice you start to get used to and you start to hear about their story. It's like having a friend in the room. And I think podcasting, certainly for men, is a really powerful way of helping and making taboo issues like uh, mental health, like suicide, something that feels easier to talk to, talk about. Yeah, and it's so accessible. Um, you know, like you were talking about doing laundry or doing dishes or things like that. You can have your earbuds in while you're doing yeah. all of these other things. And so it gives mm -hmm. those of us in that forum the op more of an opportunity to connect with our listeners because they don't have we don't have to have their hundred percent undivided attention in order for them to to absorb pieces of the information we're we're sharing. Yeah, I, I, it's exciting, and I think it's a real untapped market. I think a bit like radio has has never really gone out of fashion, um, and people tune into radio for you know certainly people who live on their own or people. Who just, I, I I will always have a podcast or something in the house. I just like listening to a conversation between two people. Um, uh, certainly, you know, in my case, two dads. I find that really interesting. There's nothing more I found when I became a parent. I was suddenly fascinated with other parents and what what are other dads doing? How are they doing this? You know, how can I do this? But you just suddenly become any of your friends who have kids. You're like, you're the oracle. I need to kind of just pick your brains on everything because I don't know what I'm doing and I need some sleep. And you know, it's the the, the learn the trajectory of your learning curve when you're a parent is probably about as intense as anything you'll ever attempt. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> You know, it it kind of reminds me of a, a conversation I had recently with a good friend and he was sharing, he's like, you know, some of the best parenting conversations I've ever had start off something like this. Oh man, I am such a, you know, crappy parent and this is why, you know, or man, I just made this horrible mistake. I don't think my kid's ever going to want to talk to me. And, and then you just kind of vent and share and, yeah. but through that process, you feel better and you hear the other person struggling in the same ways and hey maybe it's not all you know doom and gloom maybe this is just a moment in time i think if you can give another parent even if it's not someone you know i have five similar conversations with with parents at the school gates when i'm waiting for the kids to come out of school and sometimes it's parents that don't even know that well but you can just if you can give someone that space to have a conversation and you see they're a bit wobbly or it's such a powerful thing to, if i keep you know giving someone five minutes of your time, 10 minutes time, not and not speaking and not looking for an opportunity to jump in and have your go. You can really make someone's day. You can really, the number of people who I've, who I've who let me do that, and I'm like, thank you so much. I just feel so much better. Or they'll just realize, you know, as you said, you just realize what you're going through is probably not that rare. And actually, you need, we need more and more um, men, parents to come out and say, this is really hard. This is because I think what doesn't help is kind of the whole influencer lifestyle where people share that parents, you know, it's a breeze and here's us having an amazing time again. They don't, you need to see the, the, the grim stuff um, of this is so hard. And actually, I don't know if I'm any good at this. And I don't, you know, I, I'm, am I, am I enough for my kids? Am I doing enough? Are they going to be okay? I, you know, it's, I think, I think that that's, because what you find, what I found is most people kind of will say, well, look, I'll tell you what, mate, I feel the same way and I'm worried. And then you suddenly feel like, oh, okay, maybe it's, maybe it's not just me. Yeah, for sure. So how's your, um, so how's, what, what does your work look like today? So where I'm at today is, you know, I guess I didn't tell the end of the story of after I kind of took that, that time off from, from work, but I, I did end up going back on a part-time basis. And so I do still uh, work a little bit in healthcare, just a couple of days a week on the weekends. And then Monday through Friday, um, I take usually about four of those days that I'm focused on, 
on my business. And so what it looks like at this point is um, building up, you know, building up my podcast, building up my coaching program and trying to connect with people. And so that's kind of where I'm at right now. I'm still in the Brilliant. early stages of it, but I am very excited and starting to get some real positive momentum over these that's last excellent. couple of months. What's the name of the podcast? The Business of Being Dad. And where can people find it? What platforms are you on? Yeah, people can find it pretty much on all the streaming platforms, but it is absolutely on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Brilliant. Because I, I there will definitely, I mean, I have, there's a lot of, I think any dads listening to this will find this interesting. Um, but a lot of, the, I have a lot of, um, I don't know, a lot, <laughs> probably, probably a handful of followers in the States. Um, because I find it very interesting to talk, to hear from all dads, but it's also interesting to hear from dads from other countries. Like, well, what's it like? What does the landscape look like for you? I actually find it's, it's actually a lot of the, the the struggles and the stress is very similar. I don't think it's it doesn't, you know, American dads deal with the same grief and stress that British dads do. I don't think it's not. There's no uniqueness. Um, yeah, I think so too. And I, I think part of why I decided to go this route is that I am, you know, I, when I became a single father, even before all of these other things happened in our life, I just felt like there wasn't a lot out there for me. And I was oh, feeling, really? I was feeling kind of, I mean, I'm not afraid to say I was feeling kind of overwhelmed and especially for some of the logistical things. And, you know, I, I remember kind of thinking, man, I, I'm talking to other fathers, but a lot of the fathers I was talking with were married fathers and they could absolutely relate to 75% of what I was going through. But that other 25%, they had no idea because they were doing it with a partner as opposed to. Yeah. And I think what you're, what you're doing is a million times harder and different. I'm, I'm guessing there'll be lots of, there, there may be dads who, who, who look at your story and just think, Wow, that guy's amazing, and actually, I, I can definitely learn. I mean, you're—it's that saying, isn't it? You are basically being the difference that you want to see in the world. You've been through this experience, and you thought, do you know what? There wasn't the support for me, and you're be—you're creating that support, and there will absolutely be that need. That will—that you know. So it's not—it's not—it's not if you're successful, it's when you're successful. It's just a matter of of there'll be loads. You know, there will. <laughs> I think it's just a fact of life. But a lot of dads are. You know, they're a single dad for whatever reason, and 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 they need to work out how that works. You know, how how you can do that, and that's where I imagine someone like yourself would be really helpful. Yeah, thank you. It, you know, one thing that I always try to do is I try to look at a situation and say, you know, what would this look like if it was easy? You know, it's because. I'm not saying it is easy. I'm just saying, what would that look like? How would things yeah. have to change? Is there a way that we could perhaps make this easier than it currently is, you know, at least. And I think in most cases there are. And I think one thing that would have helped me at the time that I became a single father and even, you know, throughout this journey for myself is to kind of have more of a a roadmap to follow and have more of a an accountability and 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 a community of people that I was doing this with instead of feeling like I was on an island. And, you know, so that's basically what I've tried to create with my, my coaching program is, is to try to create a, it's a step-by-step -step process, but it is very customizable. And so I try to try to meet people in the very first session or two, I try to meet them wherever they're at. And we look at whatever's going on in their life and we start by trying to kind of put out the fires. You know, if there's chaos all around them, if there are immediate circumstances that need to be dealt with, um, we look at those so that we can kind of address those first. And we look at the mindset of the individual and, and find out where they're at. If they are in a place where they are beating themselves up and they're still living in that place of extreme shame and guilt and, uh, poor levels of self-worth, that's okay. But we do need to kind of talk about that yeah. as well. And so the idea early on is to prepare their mind and their environment so that everything is aligned for them to be able to go through the, the steps of the program successfully. 
there's I mean there'll be no one who is is better qualified to deal with the situation that you've been through there'll be people I suppose it's like your perfect your perfect client would be someone who was you before this incident I suppose you you will have the roadmap because you you've got the lived experience and that lived experience as heartbreaking as I imagine it must have been has will have given you you will have evolved you into having some very specific skills that really only you will understand someone you know who if someone go, has got, goes through something you've been through you're going to get it in a way that I wouldn't get it um I imagine there'll be lots of there'll be lots of things that all dads could learn from you just from your from where you've been in your mindset but actually I think I think it's exciting I think and I think where I want to be able to help is I'd love to be able to to work with other dads with podcasts you know we we, we may have, we'll have our own sort of uh, special you know our special areas but actually ultimately you know 10 20 50 100 dads who are all basically trying to support every facet of of, of fatherhood that can only be a good thing a because it helps in, you know the fairly lonely process of us doing this because it can be quite lonely i'm you know i'm i'm, I'm in the spare room um i've got to go out and help with bath time in a minute and there are times where i just think who am i to be doing this does anyone really care what i've got to say and actually, that's when you need a bit of a kind of a support. People say, no, no, let's just keep going, keep going. This is, you know, this is this is interesting. Let's see where this is, because that's what I think what you ultimately need. You said it best, you need a community, I think. Yeah, I think what you presented there is, is phenomenal. I think that's an amazing idea. And, you know, we are all chasing after the same thing. We might have our own kind of particular niche um, within fatherhood or within parenting. But we're all chasing after the same thing, and that is to improve this world by starting with fathers and, you know, the yeah. impact the fathers have on the lives of, of their families. And, you know, that is a not just a noble cause, but it is a, a need that's out there for sure. Yeah. And so it's not and this isn't to judge anyone's situations, but that there, there is a fact that children who, who it's, it's harder, it is much harder. I think you need parenting's in, incredibly hard, but we are, as you said, we owe it to our children to kind of blaze the trail and just, yes, make it easier for, to kind of, a, a, you know, to admit you're struggling with your mental health, but also just have a community where, you know, whatever you're going through, you might know. So I might know someone who, who you could talk to or or someone you could refer someone to me or I. And I think that that's only an exciting thing. That's only going to make life more interesting and make because I think I think that's what we need. I don't I don't actually ever think there's ever been more of a need for it for it than now. Yeah, it it's exciting. And, and I will say that there seems to be a lot larger group of people that are kind of entering this space right now of men that are entering this space is still a, a large need and it's still a relatively small group, but compared to the resources that were out there even three or four years ago, it is definitely growing. Yeah. And I think, you know, I think we're each playing like our role in that and we're each contributing, you know, to a piece of that for sure. I think it'd be exciting in a decade if we just keep doing this where there will be a, it will be very different and there'll be a much stronger voice of dads and men um supporting younger dads and and I and I think I hope that uh, we, we will both look back and go and have an element of, of pride that we were, we had a part in to play in that we were we were involved in that maybe maybe I didn't have my own podcast but I I, I did I did something to to support future generations of fathers yeah I think that there are a, there's probably a lot of men out there, a lot of fathers out there who aren't necessarily looking in the mirror and saying, I, I'm a horrible father, you know, or man, I need help. Who, who's out there to help me? I don't know that that's necessarily the case, No. but here's the thing. It doesn't have to be like that. I mean, I don't think any of us are, are labeling anybody as being, you know, poor, doing a poor job at no, parenting. No, I think the key is that we are looking at an opportunity to make a larger impact in the lives of our families. And I think that we can all, you know, use some, some guidance in that way. 
whether that's single fathers or married fathers or grandfathers or new fathers. I mean, there is a, there is a need that's out there and it's not saying I'm not capable. It's saying I can do a, I can do better. I can make a greater impact. I can be more effective doing this in community, in community and in conjunction with someone else who's gone down this path before me. Yeah, I think you're right. Just real quick. I'd like to say my daughters are doing great. Our family's doing great and we're all good. I just like to end it with that because of the story I shared at the beginning. I decided to set up this podcast because I really want to create an online community that supports parents, specifically dads, and I suppose even more specifically dads like myself who often struggle their mental health. If you like what I'm trying to do, please follow my podcast or if you watch this on my YouTube channel, please hit subscribe. Thank you so much for watching my podcast. I generally appreciate your support. And if you'd like a completely free digital copy of my book, First Time Dad, and would like to join my mailing list, you can do that at www.dadmindmatters.com. I hope wherever you are in the world, you're okay. Take care. Dad Mind Matters, helping men safely navigate family life without losing their minds. Two podcasts every week on a Monday and a Thursday.